to our lecture on democratization. Just as a quick overview, in today's lecture we're going to begin with a quick history lesson about democratization. Democracy has spread rapidly over the past 100 years, and we're going to look at three distinct waves of democratization. After that, we will briefly consider some of the independent variables that have been offered to explain democratization. This is one of the largest bodies of scholarship in political science, so we'll just scratch the surface, but hopefully that will give you a bit of an idea about some of the biggest contributing factors. Finally, we'll conclude by briefly thinking about the enormous research challenges facing those who wish to explain and predict democratization. So let's begin with our brief history lesson. A very influential political scientist named Samuel Huntington produced one of the definitive works on democratization and proposed that democratization had occurred in three waves as well as a couple of reverse waves or trials in which democracy failed in a few of the new transition states. The first wave occurred mainly through the 19th century in North America and Western Europe. The two starting cases were the United Kingdom as Parliament put more restrictions on the king and expanded suffrage and the United States as the institutions of the young republic became more accessible to a greater portion of society. Through the 1800s, democracy spread to 29 countries by Huntington's count. Speaking of Huntington's count of democracy, you'll notice that Huntington does not think that democracy started in the U.S. after the Revolutionary War. This is because his own conception of democracy is that there needs to be wide participation and suffrage. Therefore, he draws the line with Jacksonian democracy that began in the early 1800s when President Andrew Jackson expanded the vote to most white males, taking away the requirements on landholding that had existed before. Of course, this is arguably an arbitrary line as lots of the population was still unable to vote during Jacksonian democracy, but as we've discussed with these matters, you just have to draw the line somewhere and there are multiple valid ways to do so. So the key is that you justify your choice. The first wave was followed by the first reverse wave, or ebb, or ebb. This occurred in the period between the First and Second World Wars, a time in which dictators overthrew a number of democracies. This was the period of growing totalitarianism, with Mussolini pioneering fascism in Italy, and Hitler rising to power to establish the Nazi state in Germany. The combination of the Great Depression and the invasions of these Axis powers toppled a number of democracies so that in the midst of World War II, there were only a handful left. The second wave started in the wake of World War II with the Allies' victory. After this, the U.S. and its allies supported the establishment of democratic regimes in the former Axis powers with programs like the Marshall Plan. Such programs helped to account for the successful democratization of Japan, West Germany, and Italy. India also democratized in the second wave, as did a number of other newly independent former colonies and by 1962 there were 36 democracies in the world. But this was followed by another ebb as many of those former colonies fell back into authoritarian government, though India remains a notable exception uh, which did remain democratic. Finally comes the third wave, which is the largest wave of democratization involving a huge number of countries. It started in 1974 in Portugal with the Carnation Revolution that overthrew that country's military dictator and spread so widely that by the end of the Cold War, a political scientist named Francis Fukuyama declared the end of history. Of course, he didn't mean that nothing would ever happen again, but that the real ideological debates had all given way to a universal recognition of democracy and liberal egalitarian values as best. We'll see that this was quite premature, but at the time there was so much dramatic democratization happening that we can see why he might have jumped to such a conclusion. The third wave is a long wave that started in southern Europe with the end of a few military dictatorships. In Portugal, a popular uprising led to the Carnation Revolution and the establishment of a democratic regime. In Greece, infighting among the generals led to the end of that country's military dictatorship and the eventual establishment of the modern Greek democracy. Finally, Spain's longtime dictator, Francisco Franco, died in 1975, and the Spanish monarchy helped guide the country towards democracy, culminating with the country's 1978 democratic constitution. From southern Europe, the third wave really spread around the world. Latin America's military dictatorships fell one by one, leaving the entire region virtually 100% democratic, at least nominally. Here we see the five presidents of Brazil since the establishment of Brazilian democracy in 1980. East Asia and Africa also saw some democratization. Notably, the terrible apartheid regime in South Africa ended, and Nelson Mandela came to power as that country's president for the first time elected by universal suffrage. Finally, the zenith of the third wave is arguably the fall of communism, 
the fall of the Berlin Wall and the Iron Curtain created 27 now formerly communist countries, and a significant number of those actually transitioned to democracy. So has there been a third ebb? This is debatable, and the borders of the third wave are not really defined very well, with some arguing that it is still ongoing. Still, it is safe to say that history did not end, not even in the way that Fukuyama meant, as liberal democracy faces plenty of challenges today. That said, there was no dramatic ebb, and democracy is a widely popular international standard that even dictators try to pay lip service to. The closest thing we can say is that many of the, quote, new democracies never got to a very high level of democracy. Some of them are simply democracies with significant problems, such as delegative democracies. Many of them are probably best described as some sort of hybrid regime, like electoral authoritarianism. One prime example is Russia, which seemed to be on the path towards democratization in the 1990s, but saw the process be derailed by what we used to call Putinization, as Vladimir and his pals were able to consolidate power around themselves. We'll end this little history of democracy lesson by reflecting on whether a fourth wave is breaking today. Will the Arab revolts go down as a fourth wave of widespread democratization? Well, it is clear that something is happening. You can see in this map of the Middle East and North Africa here that pretty much every country has been shaded some color, which means there's been some sort of protest. So just having some sort of protest, that's the tan, uh, protests that have been met with significant reforms from the government, that is that bright blue, and then the black actually shows where protests led to the government being completely overthrown. It would be very significant for these countries to democratize because today the Middle East is still an amazing outlier for being the least democratic region. Still, it's far too early to say whether these countries are heading towards sustainable democracy or towards something else. So let's turn to thinking about what causes sustainable democracy. What could we use to predict whether and where the Arab revolts will result in democracy? In other words, democratization is our dependent variable, the effect we want to explain, and we are looking for its causes, or independent variables. Why did our waves occur where and when they did? What explains democratization? This is an enticing question, so it's an enormous part of political science. Tons of potential individual variables have been set forth. Here's just a partial list offered by our friend Sam Huntington, and you can see that it's a highly diverse list, including everything from a market economy to Protestantism to the desires of political elites to a history of having a feudal aristocracy. Some of them are blatantly contradictory. Both very diverse or heterogeneous societies and not so diverse or homogeneous societies can be said to contribute to democratization. Thinking about all of the variables that contribute to democratization is something that can take and has taken many lifetimes. We're just going to look at four really broad potential approaches to explaining democratization. Cultural influence, modernization, rational choice or leadership-centered approaches, and the emphasis on international influence. The first approach looks to a society's culture to explain its government. The basic idea is that certain cultures are more encouraging of democracy than others. One of the most famous examples of an argument like this comes from Max Weber, who argued that there is something about Protestantism and its emphasis on the individual and individual responsibility that is good for capitalist societies, and to a lesser degree, good for democratic governance as well. Another famous example of a cultural argument comes from de Tocqueville, a French social scientist who traveled to the States in the wake of the Revolutionary War to study this society. He believed that American de democratic government was successfully developing because of the culture of the former colonies, which he found to be particularly open to participation in forums like town halls or civic associations, as well as particularly egalitarian, which uh, in comparison to Europe and the European aristocracy at the time, it certainly was. The most influential modern example of a cultural argument is Gabriel Allman and Sidney Verba's civic culture theory. They argued that democracy really required a certain kind of culture that was participatory, but also moderate, so that the citizens looked over their government's shoulders enough, but didn't get so involved as to keep it from governing at all. Finally, lots of people have studied whether the tenets of liberal democracy are compatible with Islam. Though the argument that mainstream Islamic values are unsupportive of democracy or that Muslims do not want democracy or equality is ungrounded when it comes to discussing the majority of Muslims. The next argument is one that we have seen before, the modernization hypothesis, 
The idea here is that economic development causes democratization, and this basic idea is supported by a very strong correlation between economic wealth and development. Of course, we all know that correlation does not equal causation, so what we need are theories that link economic development to democratization. In other words, we need causal mechanisms. Again, there are a ton of them. One idea is that economic development creates much more complex societies and economies than the sort of peasant lord agrarian society of the distant past. This makes it much more difficult for dictators to keep tabs on everyone. A related idea is that this process creates a middle class with its own independent power and demands, and that this middle class is able to pressure the regime for expanded access to political power. Expanded education and widespread literacy are expected to work in a similar way, as more educated cis as more educated citizens are more empowered to struggle for their political rights. Finally, there's also the idea that economic development is linked to the cultural arguments that we just talked about, with economic development causing cultural change in a direction of valuing individual rights and equality in a way that is good for democracy. The idea here is that once you get the parochial, suspicious, ultra-fundamentalist, intolerant, superstitious of any caste or creed out of the village and get them plugged into the rest of the world, they become more moderate and tolerant in their views. These are just a few of the causal mechanisms that have been proposed. This basic idea was laid out by a sociologist named Seymour Martin Lipset, and he proposed a complicated and interrelated causal chain that we see here to the left, and that includes many of the causal mechanisms we just went over. Modernization theory is supported by a lot of evidence, but it is by no means uncontested. On the contrary, this has been a very hotly debated topic. One of the biggest objections to modernization theory is the idea that modernization is always a process that betters society and makes it more democratic. Some influential scholars have pointed out that modernization is in fact a very violent change in many societies that creates great social upheaval. For example, Huntington argued that it mobilizes the forces of society and that this mobilization can just as easily be undemocratic as democratic. A sociologist named Barrington Moore argued that it was a turbulent process that could have multiple paths. He studied the history of modernization in many countries and showed that in some places, Modernization led to communism or totalitarianism, not democracy. There are also some empirical exceptions or instances in the real world that contradict the theory. For instance, the oil-rich Arab Gulf states like Saudi Arabia are richer than many democracies and well beyond the thresholds of wealth that modernization theory would predict should lead to democratization. This is probably best explained by the resource curse, as these leaders are often able to use their oil revenue to buy off sections of society that might try to oppose them. Another exception is India, which is the world's most populous democracy, but is also a relatively poor country. We will talk about this exception in future lectures, as some social scientists have suggested that the structure of Indian society helps explain this exception. Finally, modernization theory has been abused by real-world policymakers and leaders. You'll remember that there is an entire category of dictatorship called modernizing authoritarianism in which the leadership argues that a country is too poor and not ready for democracy, and uses this to legitimize their rule in postponing democracy until the country is, quote, ready for democracy. So this is an example of how a dictator can abuse the modernization hypothesis to justify their rule. This theory has also encouraged misguided attempts to make all countries look like the West, a one-size-fits-all emphasis on urbanization, industrialization, and overall westernization that has had damaging effects upon many of rural farmers that make up huge portions of the population for most of the developing world. So let's turn to a third approach, and this approach looks more at the specifics of the events and personalities within the transitions to figure out what will happen and why. One increasingly influential approach uses rational choice models borrowed from economics in order to understand and make predictions about political upheavals and democratic transitions. This school of thought is often called transitology and it is a relatively flexible and useful approach, though it doesn't specify any one key independent variable in particular as an approach. Instead, transitologists begin by identifying who the important actors are within a society, those actors who will determine how things unravel during a political upheaval. These might be hardliners or softliners within the old regime, or moderates versus extremists within the opposition to that regime. They might also go into greater detail and model from the perspective of different parts of society, or especially different parts of the selectorate. After identifying the key characters, those characters are given 
priorities. Maybe for the regime to stay in power, or at least not to end up with their heads on a stick, and for the opposition to get democratic elections, or again, at least not to end up with their heads on a stick. So with these preferences in mind, transitologists can use game theory to model strategic interactions between the players and make predictions about what will happen under various situations. To the right here, we see a rather simple form of game theory, which is called a decision tree. Another approach is to look at the role of the individual leader. This approach goes back to Machiavelli's famous work, The Prince, in which he argues that a good leader or prince should have virtue, which is the desire and capability to provide for the better good of his realm. It is almost certainly the case that individual leaders are extremely important for outcomes, as sometimes you get a great leader like a Nelson Mandela, who helped lead South Africa towards reconciliation after apartheid, or a Václav Havel, the playwright turned president of the Czech Republic who helped lead that country out of communism. But of course there aren't always Mandela's, Havel's, not to mention Gandhi's around every corner. The problem with this approach empirically is that emphasizing an individual leader by definition makes it impossible to talk about the generalizable trends that help us understand democratization and other social phenomena. So comparative politics has less to say about this, even though it is undoubtedly a factor. Finally, an increasingly important approach looks at the independent variables from the international environment. This is more and more important because globalization is bringing the world's states ever closer to one another. It also makes a lot of sense given what we know about the history of democracy from our brief overview. It seems to happen in waves. Not only that, but during those waves, countries that democratize tend to be close together in both time and space. Take the example of the third wave's progression, unfurling within a couple of years in southern Europe, breaking in Latin America all around the same time, and then taking in much of Eastern Europe, again relatively in the same period. The Arab revolts are another good example. The point is that these things tend to spread almost like they are a contagious virus. It's also the case that having a democratic neighbor is a really good predictor of who will democratize. It seems like there are good neighborhoods for democracy, like the Americas or Europe, and bad neighborhoods, like North Africa and the Middle East, at least up until today. Foreign intervention is also a key factor. NATO, the US, the EU, and a slew of nonprofits and non governmental organizations work to promote democracy abroad. For instance, the fact that a number of post communist countries were right on the edge of the EU and were offered the chance to become full members if they reformed their political system goes a long way in explaining why countries like Estonia, Poland, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Hungary were able to democratize so quickly. Of course, foreign influence isn't always that benign as great power politics like those played between the US and the Soviet Union often meant that any ally, democratic or not, got support. So that's our rapid ride to the possible causes of democratization. So which theory is correct? We don't have the answer to that one yet, unfortunately. And this is because of some of the familiar old problems of comparative politics. We've got huge, complex units that we're trying to study, states. And there are tons of variables, everything from literacy rates to GDP to public opinion in each state to the desires of individual leaders, and so on and so forth. Like with other huge outcomes in comparative politics, democratization is incredibly complex, so no one theory is likely to be able to capture it. Therefore, we're again open to our old friends' omitted variable bias and reverse causation. For instance, with so many potential variables, it is really hard for any one study to include every pertinent variable and to avoid omitted variable bias. Moreover, lots of the correlates of democracy might be caused by democracy instead of causing democracy themselves. This reverse causation is a common accusation against the modernization hypothesis. Many hold that democracy might provide economic growth instead of economic growth causing democratization. Finally, it's important to try and distinguish between democratic transition and democratic consolidation. This can be a tricky distinction, but the first is when a country moves to a democracy initially, and the latter is when democracy becomes entrenched, such that in the word of one political scientist, it's the only game in town. So basically, consolidation is the point at which every significant actor within the country believes that politics should take place within the arena of democratic elections, democratic politics. There's a big difference between the transition that brings the first democratic election and the long process of getting democracy to work and to deepen in a state so that it lasts for the long term. The trick here is that democratization binds these two processes together under one label, even though what is good for democratic transition may not always be good for democratic consolidation and vice versa. Remember that waves are often accompanied by troughs, meaning that the countries that make democratic transitions 
are not necessarily always going to successfully make democratic consolidation. That may be because many of the variables we described above are working at cross purposes. They're good for one, but not the other. So in summary, the history of democratization seems to follow three waves. Because democratization is such an enormous, long and complex process, there are many, many potential variables that can contribute to it. And because of this, we run into the typical problems with comparative politics and social science more generally, and we don't get many conclusive conclusions out of it, unfortunately. So that's all for now. Go off and enjoy your democracy.